This is for educational purposes only. Dianetics, Modern Science of Mental Health by L. Ron Hubbard. How to read. Dianetics is an adventure. It is an exploration into terra incognita, the human mind, that vast and hitherto unknown realm half an inch back of our foreheads. The discoveries and developments which made the formulation of Dianetics possible occupied many years of exact research and careful testing. This was exploration, it was also consolidation. The trail is blazed, the routes are sufficiently mapped for you to voyage in safety into your own mind and recover the your full inherent potential, which is not, we now know, low but very, very high. As you progress in therapy, the adventure is yours to know why you did what you did when you did it, to know what caused those dark and unknown fears which came in nightmares as a child to know where your moments of pain and pleasure lay. There is much which an individual does not know about himself, about his parents, about his motives. Some of the things you will find may astonish you, for the most important data of your life may be not memory, but engrams in the hidden depths of your mind, not articulate, but only destructive. You will find many reasons why you cannot get well and you will know at length, when you find the dictating lines in the engrams how amusing those reasons are, especially to you, Dianetics is no solemn adventure, for all that it has to do with suffering and loss, its end is always laughter, so foolish, so misinterpreted were the things which caused the woe, your first voyage into your own terra incognita will be through the pages of this book, you will find as you read that many things you always knew were so are articulated here, you will be gratified to know that you held not opinions, but scientific facts, in many of your concepts of existence. You will find, too, many data that have long been known by all, and you will possibly consider them far from news and be prone to under-evaluate them. Be assured that under-evaluation of these facts kept them from being valuable, no matter how long they were known, for a fact is never important without a proper evaluation of it and its precise relationship to other facts. You are following here a vast network of facts which, reaching out, can be seen to embrace the whole field of man in all his works. Fortunately you do not have to concern yourself with following far any one of these lines until you are done. And then these horizons will stretch wide enough to satisfy anyone. Dianetics is a large subject, but that is only because man is himself a large subject. The science of his thought cannot but embrace all his actions. By careful compartmenting and relating of data. The field has been kept narrow enough to be easily followed. Mostly this handbook will tell you, without any specific mention, about yourself and your family and friends, for you will meet them here and know them. This volume has made no effort to use resounding or thunderous phrases, frowning polysyllables or professorial detachment. When one is delivering answers which are simple. He need not make the communication any more difficult than is necessary to convey the ideas. Basic language has been used, much of the nomenclature is colloquial, the pedantic has not only not been employed, it has also been ignored. This volume communicates to several strata of life and professions, the favorite nomenclatures of none have been observed since such a usage would impede the understanding of others. And so bear with us, psychiatrist when your structure is not used, for we have no need for structure here, and bear with us, doctor, when we call a cold a cold and not a catarrhal disorder of the respiratory tract, for this is, essentially, engineering and these engineers are liable to say anything, and scholar, you would not enjoy being burdened with the summation signs and the Lawrence Fitzgerald Einstein equations. So we shall not burden the less puristic reader with scientifically impossible Hegelian grammar which insists that absolutes exist in fact. The plan of the book might be represented as a cone which starts with simplicity and descends into wider application. This book follows, more or less, the actual steps of the development of Dianetics. First there was the dynamic principle of existence, then its meaning then the source of aberration and finally the application of all as therapy and the techniques of therapy. You won't find any of this very difficult. It was the originator who had the difficulty. You should have seen the first equations and postulates of Dianetics. As research progressed and as the field developed, 
Dianetics began to simplify. That is a fair guarantee that one is on a straight trail of science. Only things which are poorly known become more complex the longer one works upon them. It is suggested that you read straight on through. By the time you get to the end, you should have an excellent command of the subject. The book is arranged that way. Every fact related to Dianetic therapy is stated in several ways and is introduced again and again. In this way the important facts have been pointed up to your attention. When you have finished the book, you can come back to the beginning and look through it and study what you think you need to know. Almost all the basic philosophy and certainly all the derivations of the master subject of Dianetics were excluded here partly because this volume had to stay under half a million words and partly because they belong in a separate text where they can receive full justice. Nevertheless, you have the scope of the science with this volume in addition to therapy itself. You are beginning an adventure. Treat it as an adventure. And may you never be the same again. Book 1. The Goal of Man. Scope of Dianetics. A science of mind is a goal which has engrossed thousands of generations of man. Armies dynasties and whole civilizations have perished for the lack of it. Rome went to dust for the want of it. China swims in blood for the need of it. And down in the arsenal is an atom bomb, it's hopeful knows full armed in ignorance of it. No quest has been more relentlessly pursued or has been more violent. No primitive tribe, no matter how ignorant, has failed to recognize the problem as a problem nor has it failed to bring forth at least an attempted formulation. Today one finds the aborigine of Australia substituting for a science of mind a magic healing crystal. The shaman of British Guiana makes shift for actual mental laws with his monotonous song and consecrated cigar, the throbbing drum of the goldy medicine man serves in the stead of an adequate technique to alleviate the lack of serenity in patients. The enlightened and golden age of Greece yet had but superstition in its principal sanitaria for mental ills, the Esculapian temple. The most the Roman could do for peace of mind for the sick was to appeal to the Penates, the household divinities, or sacrifice to Febric goddess of fevers, and an English king, centuries after, could have been found in the hands of exorcists who sought to cure his deliriums by driving the demons from him. From the most ancient times to the present, in the crudest primitive tribe or the most magnificently ornamented civilization, man has found himself in a state of awed helplessness when confronted by the phenomena of strange illnesses or aberrations. His desperation in his efforts to treat the individual has been but slightly altered during his entire history and, until this 20th century past midterm, the percentages of his alleviations, in terms of individual mental derangements, compared evenly with the successes of the shamans confronted with the same problems. According to a modern writer, the single advance of psychotherapy was clean quarters for the madman. In terms of brutality in treatment of the insane, the methods of the shaman or bedlam have been far exceeded by the civilized techniques of destroying nerve tissues with the violence of shock and surgery, treatments which were not warranted by the results obtained and which would not have been tolerated in the meanest primitive society since they reduce the victim to mere zombieism, destroying most of his personality and ambition and leaving him nothing more than a manageable animal. Far from an indictment of the practices of the neurosurgeon and the ice pick which he thrusts and twists into insane minds, they are brought forth only to demonstrate the depths of desperation man can reach when confronted with the seemingly unsolvable problem of deranged minds. In the larger sphere of societies and nations, the lack of such a science of mind was never more evident, for the physical sciences, advancing thoughtlessly far in advance of man's ability to understand man, have armed him with terrible and thorough weapons which await only another outburst of the social insanity of war. These problems are not mild ones, they lie across every man's path, they wait in company with his future. As long as man has recognized that his chief superiority over the animal kingdom was a thinking mind, so long as he understood that his mind alone was his weapon, he has searched and pondered and postulated in efforts to find a solution. Like a jigsaw puzzle spilled by a careless hand, the equations which would lead to a science of the mind and, above that, to a master science of the universe, were stirred round and round. Sometimes two fragments would be united, sometimes, as in the case of the golden age of Greece, 
a whole section would be built. Philosopher, shaman, medicine man, mathematician, each looked at the pieces. Some saw they must all belong to different puzzles. Some thought they all belonged to the same puzzle. Some said there were really six puzzles in it, some said two. And the wars went on and the societies sickened or were dispersed and learned tomes were written about ever-increasing hordes of madmen. With the methods of Bacon, with the mathematics of Newton, the physical sciences went on consolidating and advancing their frontiers. And like a derelict battalion, careless of how many allied ranks it exposed to destruction by the enemy, studies of the mind lagged behind. But after all, there are just so many pieces in any puzzle. Before and after Francis Bacon, Herbert Spencer and a very few more, Many of the small sections had been put together, many honest facts had been observed. To adventure into the thousands of variables of which that puzzle was composed, one had only to know right from wrong, true from false, and use all man and nature as his test tube. Of what must a science of mind be composed? 1. An answer to the goal of thought. 2. A single source of all insanities, psychoses, neuroses, compulsions repressions and social derangements. 3. Invariant scientific evidence as to the basic nature and functional background of the human mind. 4. Techniques. The art of application, by which the discovered single source could be invariably cured, ruling out, of course, the insanities of malformed, deleted or pathologically injured brains or nervous systems and, particularly, iatrogenic psychoses those caused by doctors and involving the destruction of the living brain itself. 5. Methods of prevention of mental derangement. 6. The cause and cure of all psychosomatic ills, which number, some said, 70% of man's listed ailments. Such a science would exceed the severest terms previously laid down for it in any age, but any computation on the subject should discover that a science of mind ought to be able to be and do just these things. A science of the mind, if it were truly worthy of that name, would have to rank in experimental precision with physics and chemistry. There could be no special cases to its laws. There could be no recourse to authority. The atom bomb bursts whether Einstein gives it permission or not. Laws native to nature regulate the bursting of that bomb. Technicians applying techniques derived from discovered natural laws, can make one or a million atom bombs all alike. After the body of axioms and technique was organized and working as a science of mind, in rank with the physical sciences, it would be found to have points of agreement with almost every school of thought about thought which had ever existed. This is again a virtue and not a fault. Simple though it is, Dianetics does and is these things. 1. It is an organized science of thought built on definite axioms, statements of natural laws on the order of those of the physical sciences. 2. It contains a therapeutic technique with which can be treated all inorganic mental ills and all organic psychosomatic ills, with assurance of complete cure in unselected cases. 3. It produces a condition of ability and rationality for man well in advance of the current norm enhancing rather than destroying his vigor and personality. 4. Dianetics gives a complete insight into the full potentialities of the mind, discovering them to be well in excess of past supposition. 5. The basic nature of man is discovered in Dianetics, rather than hazarded or postulated, since that basic nature can be brought into action in any individual completely, and that basic nature is discovered to be good. 6. The single source of mental derangement is discovered and demonstrated on a clinical or laboratory basis by Dianetics. 7. The extent, storage capacity and recallability of the human memory is finally established by Dianetics. 8. The full recording abilities of the mind are discovered by Dianetics with the conclusion that they are quite dissimilar to former suppositions. 9. Dianetics brings forth the non-germ theory of disease 
complementing biochemistry and Pasteur's work on the germ theory to embrace the field. 2. With Dianetics sense the necessity of destroying the brain by shock or surgery to effect tractability in mental patients and adjust them. 11. A workable explanation of the physiological effects of drugs and endocrine substances exists in Dianetics and many problems posed by endocrinology are answered. 12. Various educational, sociological, political, military and other human studies are enhanced by Dianetics. 13. The field of cytology is aided by Dianetics, as well as other fields of research. This, then, is a skeletal sketch of what would be the scope of a science of mind and of what is the scope of Dianetics. The clear, Dianetically, the optimum individual is called the clear. One will hear much of that word, both as a noun and a verb, in this volume, so it is well to spend time here at the outset setting forth exactly what can be called a clear. The goal of Dianetic Therapy A clear can be tested for any and all psychoses, neuroses, compulsions and repressions, all aberrations, and can be examined for any autogenic, self-generated, diseases referred to as psychosomatic hills. These tests confirm the clear to be entirely without such ills or aberrations. Additional tests of his intelligence indicate it to be high above the current norm. Observation of his activity demonstrates that he pursues existence with vigor and satisfaction. Further, these results can be obtained on a comparative basis. A neurotic individual, possessed also of psychosomatic hills, can be tested for those aberrations and illnesses, demonstrating that they exist. He can then be given Dianetic Therapy to the end of clearing these neuroses and ills. Finally, he can be examined, with the above results. This, in passing, is an experiment which has been performed many times with invariable results. It is a matter of laboratory test that all individuals who have organically complete nervous systems respond in this fashion to Dianetic Clearing. Further. The clear possesses attributes, fundamental and inherent but not always available in an uncleared state, which have not been suspected of man and are not included in past discussions of his abilities and behavior. First there is the matter of perceptions. Even so-called normal people do not always see in full color, hear in full tone, or sense at the optimum with their organs of smell, taste tactile and organic sensation. These are the main lines of communication to the finite world which most people recognize as reality. It is an interesting commentary that while past observers felt that the facing of reality was an absolute necessity if the aberrated individual wished to be sane, no definition of how this was to be done was set forth. To face reality in the present, one would certainly have to be able to sense it along those channels of communication most commonly used by man in his affairs. Any one of man's perceptions can be aberrated by psychic derangements which refuse to permit the received sensations to be realized by the analytical portion of the individual's mind. In other words, while there may be nothing wrong with the mechanisms of color reception, circuits can exist in the mind which delete color before the consciousness is permitted to see the object. Color blindness can be discovered to be relative or in degrees in such a way that colors appear to be less brilliant, dull, or at the maximum, entirely absent. Anyone is acquainted with persons to whom loud colors are detestable and with persons who find them insufficiently loud to notice. This varying degree of color blindness has not been recognized as a psychic factor but has been nebulously assumed to be some sort of a condition of mind when it was noticed at all. There are those persons to whom noises are quite disturbing, to whom, for instance, the insistent twine of a violin is very like having a brace and bit applied to the eardrum, and there are those to whom fifty violins, played loudly, would be soothing, and there are those who, in the presence of a violin, express disinterest and boredom, and, again, there are persons to whom the sound of a violin, no matter if it be playing the most intricate melody, is a monotone. These differences of sonic, hearing, perception have, like color and other visual errors, been attributed to inherent nature or organic deficiency or assigned no place at all. In a like manner, from person to person, smells, tactile sensations, organic perceptions, 
pain and gravity vary widely and wildly, a cursory check around among his friends will demonstrate to a man that there exist enormous differences of perception of identical stimuli, one smells a turkey in the oven as wonderful, one smells it with indifference, another may not smell it at all, and somebody else may maintain that roasting turkey smells exactly like hair oil, to be extreme, until we obtain clears, it remains obscure why such differences should exist, for in the largest measure, such wild quality and quantity of perception is due to aberration, because of pleasurable experiences in the past and inherent sensitivity, there will be some difference among clears and a clear response should not be assumed automatically to be a standardized, adjusted middle ground, that pallid and obnoxious goal of past doctrines. The clear gets a maximum response compatible with his own desire for the response. Burning cordite still smells dangerous to him, but it does not make him ill. Roasting turkey smells good to him if he's hungry and likes turkey, at which time it smells very, very good. Violins play melodies, not monotones bring no pain and are enjoyed to a fine full limit if the clear likes violins as a matter of taste if he doesn't, he likes kettle drums, saxophones or, indeed, suiting his mood, no music at all, in other words, there are two variables at work, one, the wildest, is the variable caused by aberrations, the other, and quite rational and understandable, is caused by the personality, thus the perceptions of an abri, non-cleared individual, vary greatly from those of the cleared, unaberrated, individual. Now there are the differences of the actual organs of perception and the errors occasioned by these. Some of these errors, a minimum, are organic, punctured eardrums are not competent sound recording mechanisms. The majority of perceptic, sense message, errors in the organic sphere are caused by psychosomatic errors. Glasses are seen on noses everywhere around, even on children. The majority of these spectacles are perched on the face in an effort to correct a condition which the body itself is fighting to uncorrect again. Eyesight, when the stage of glasses is entered, not because of glasses is deteriorating on the psychosomatic principle, and this observation is about as irresponsible as a statement that when apples fall out of trees, they usually obey gravity. One of the incidental things which happens to a clear is that his eyesight, if it had been bad as an abri, generally improves markedly and, with some slight attention, will recover optimum perception in time. Far from an optician's argument against Dianetics, this assures rather good business, for clears have been known at treatment center to have to buy, in rapid succession, five pairs of glasses to compensate adjusting eyesight, and many abaries cleared late in life settle down ocularly at a maximum a little under optimum, the eyesight was reduced in the abbey on an organic basis by his aberrations so that the perceptic organ itself was reduced from optimum operating function. With the removal of aberrations, repeated tests have proven that the body makes a valiant effort to reconstruct back to optimum. Abbey is a neologism meaning an aberrated person. Hearing, in addition to other perceptics, varies organically over a wide range. Calcium deposits, for instance can make the ears ring incessantly. The removal of operations penets the body to readjust toward its reachable optimum, the calcium deposit disappears and the ears stop ringing. But far and beyond this very specific case, there are great differences in hearing on the organic basis. Organically as well as aberrationally, hearing can become remarkably extended or closely inhibited so that one person may hear footsteps a block away as a normal activity and another would not hear a bass drum thundering on the porch. That the various perceptions differ widely from individual to individual on an aberrational and psychosomatic basis is the least of the discoveries outlined here. Ability to recall is far more fantastic in its variation from person to person. An entirely new recall process which was inherent in the mind but which had not been noticed, came to light in the process of observing clears and abarees. This recall process is possible in only a small proportion of abarees in its fullest sense. It is standard, however, in a clear. Naturally, no intimation is made here that the scholars of past ages have been unobservant. We are dealing here with an entirely new and hitherto non-existent object of inspection, the clear. What a clear can do easily. Quite a few people have, 
from time to time, been partially able to do in the past, an inherent, not a taught, ability of the remembering mechanisms of the mind can be termed, as a technical word of Dianetics, returning. It is used in its dictionary sense, with the addition of the fact that the mind has it as a normal remembering function as follows. The person can send a portion of his mind to a past period on either a mental or combined mental and physical basis and can re-experience incidents which have taken place in his past in the same fashion and with the same sensations as before. Once upon a time an art known as hypnotism used what was called regression on hypnotized subjects, the hypnotist sending the subject back in one of two ways to incidents in his past. This was done with trance techniques drugs and considerable technology, the hypnotic subject could be sent back to a moment entirely so that he gave every appearance of being the age to which he was returned with only the apparent faculties and recollections he had at that moment, this was called revivification, reliving. Regression was a technique by which part of the individual's self remained in the present and part went back to the past. These abilities of the mind were supposed native only in hypnotism and were used only in hypnotic technique. The art is very old, tracing back some thousands of years and existing today in Asia as it has existed, apparently from the dawn of time. Returning is substituted for regression here because it is not a comparable thing and because regression, as a word, has some bad meanings which would interrupt its use. Reliving is substituted for revivification in Dianetics because, in Dianetics, the principles of hypnotism can be found explained and hypnotism is not used in Dianetic therapy, as will be explained later. The mind, then, has another ability to remember. Part of the mind can return, even when a person is wide awake, and re-experience past incidents in full. If you want to test this, try it on several people until one is discovered who does it easily. Wide awake, he can return to moments in his past. Until asked to do so, he probably will not know he has such an ability. If he had it, he probably thought everybody could do it. The type of supposition which has kept so much of this data from coming to light before. He can go back to a time when he was swimming and swim with full recall of hearing, sight, taste, smell, organic sensation, tactile, etc. A learned gentleman once spent some hours demonstrating to a gathering that the recall of a smell as a sensation, for instance, was quite impossible since neurology had proven that the olfactory nerves were not connected to the thalamus. Two people in the gathering discovered this ability to return and, despite this evidence, the learned gentleman continued the dispute that olfactory recall was impossible. A check among the gathering on this faculty, independent of returning, brought forth the fact that one half of those present remembered a smell by smelling it again. Returning is the full performance of imagery recall. The entire memory is able to make the organ areas resense the stimuli in a past incident. Partial recall is common, not common enough to be normal, but certainly common enough to have merited considerable study. For it again is a wide variable. Perception of the present would be one method of facing reality. But if one cannot face the reality of the past then, in some part, he is not facing some portion of reality. And if it is agreed that facing reality is desirable, then one would have to face yesterday's reality as well if were to be considered entirely sane by contemporary definition. To face yesterday requires a certain condition of recall to be available. One would have to be able to remember. But how many ways are there of remembering? First there is the return. That is new. It gives the advantage of examining the moving pictures and other sense perceptions recorded at the time of the event with all senses present. He can also return to his past conclusions and imaginings. It is of considerable aid in learning, in research, in ordinary living, to be able to be again at the place where the data desired was first inspected. Then there are the more usual recalls. Optimum recall is by the return method of single or multiple senses, the individual himself remaining in present time. In other words, some people, when they think of a rose, see one, smell one, feel one. They see in full color, vividly, with the mind's eye to use an old colloquialism. They smell it vividly, and they can feel it even to the thorns. They are thinking about roses by actually recalling a rose. These people, thinking about a ship, would see a specific ship, 
feel the motion of her if the thought of being aboard her, smell the pine tar or even less savory odors and hear whatever sounds there were about her. They would see the ship in full color motion and hear it in full tone audio. These faculties vary widely in the abbey. Some, when told to think of a rose, can merely visualize one. Some can smell one but not see it. Some see it without color or in very pale color. When told to think of a ship, some abbeys only see a flat, colorless, still picture such as a painting of a ship or the photograph of one. Some perceive a vessel in motion without color but with sound. Some hear the sound of a ship but fail to see any picture whatever. Some merely think of a ship as a concept that ships exist and that they know about them and fail to see, feel, hear, smell or otherwise sense anything on a recall basis. Some past observers have called this imagery, but the term is so inapplicable to sound and touch organic sensation and pain that recall is used uniformly as the technical dianetic term. The value of recall in this business of living has occupied such scant attention that the entire concept has never been formulated previously. It is therefore detailed at some length here, as above. It is quite simple to test recalls. If one will ask his fellows what their abilities are, he will gain a remarkable idea of how widely varied this ability is from individual to individual. Some have this recall, some have that, some have none but operate on concepts of recall only. And remember, if you make a test on those around you, that any perception is filed in the memory and therefore has a recall which is to include pain, temperature, rhythm, taste and weight with the above mentioned sight, sound tactile and smell. The Dianetic names for these recalls are visio, sight, sonic, sound, tactile, touch, olfactory, smell, rhythmic, kinesthetic, weight and motion, somatic, pain, thermal, temperature, and organic, internal sensations and, by new definition, emotion. Then there is another set of mental activities which can be summated under the headings of imagination and creative efflogination. Here again is abundant material for testing. Imagination is the recombination of things one has sensed, thought or intellectually computed into existence, which do not necessarily have existence. This is the mind's method of envisioning desirable goals or forecasting futures. Imagination is extremely valuable as a part of essential solutions in any mental problem and in everyday existence. That it is recombination in no sense deprives it of its vast and wonderful complexity. A clear use is imagination in its entirety. There is an imagination impression for sight, smell, taste, sound in short for each one of the possible perceptions. These are manufactured impressions on the basis of models in the memory banks combined by conceptual ideas and construction. New physical structures, tomorrow in terms of today, next year in terms of last year, pleasure to be gained, deeds to be done, accidents to avoid, all these are imaginational functions. The clear has full color visio, tone sonic, tactile, olfactory, rhythmic, kinesthetic, venal and organic imagination in kind. Asked to envision himself riding in a gilded coach and four, he sees the equipage moving in full color, he hears all the noises which should be present, he smells the smells he thinks should be there, and he feels the upholstery, the motion, and the presence in the coach of himself. In addition to standard imagination there is creative imagination. This is a very wide undimensional ability quite variable from individual to individual, possessed in enormous quantity by some. It is included here, not as a portion of the operation of the mind treated as a usual part of Dianetics, but to isolate it as an existing entity. In a clear who possessed creative imagination, even if inhibited, as an abri, it is present and demonstrable. It is inherent. It can be aberrated only by prohibition of its general practice, which is to say, by aberrating the persistence in its application or insisting the whole mind. But creative imagination, that possession by which works of art are done, states built and man enriched, can be envisioned as a special function, independent in operation and in no way dependent for its existence upon an aberrated condition in the individual, since the examination of its activity in and use by a clear possessing it adequately demonstrates its inherent character. It is rarely absent in any individual. Finally, there is the last, 
but most important activity of the mind. Men is to be regarded as a sentient being. His sentience depends upon his ability to resolve problems by perceiving or creating and understanding situations. This rationality is the primary, high echelon function of that part of the mind which makes him a man, not just another animal. Remembering, perceiving, imagining, he has the signal ability of resolving conclusions and of using conclusions resolved to resolve further conclusions. This is rational man. Rationality as divorced from aberration, can be studied in a cleared person only. The aberrations of the aberree give him the appearance of irrationality. Though such irrationality may be given the gentler names of eccentricity or human error or even personal idiosyncrasy, it is, nevertheless, irrationality. The personality does not depend upon how irrationally a man may act. It is not a personality trait, for instance, to drive while drunk and kill a child on a crosswalk or even to risk killing a child by driving while drunk. Irrationality is simply that. The inability to get right answers from data. Now it is a curious thing that although everybody knows, and what a horrible amount of misinformation that statement lets circulate, it is human to err. The sentient portion of the mind which computes the answers to problems and which makes man man is utterly incapable of error. This was a startling discovery when it was made but it need not have been, it could have been deduced some time before, for it is quite simple and easy to understand. The actual computing ability of man is never in error, even in a very severely aberrated person. Observing the activity of such an aberrated person, one might thoughtlessly suppose that that person's computations were wrong, but that would be an observer error, any person, aberrated or clear computes perfectly on the data stored and perceived. Take any common calculating machine, and the mind is an exceptionally magnificent instrument far, far superior to any machine it will invent for ages to come, and put a problem on it for solution. Multiply seven times one. It will answer, properly, seven. Now multiply six times one but continue to hold down the seven. 6 times 1 is 6 but the answer you will get is 42. Continue to hold down 7 and put other problems on the machine. They are wrong, not as problems, but as answers. Now fix 7 so that it stays down no matter what keys are touched and try to give the machine away. Nobody will want it because, obviously, the machine is crazy. It says 10 times 10 is 700. But is the calculating portion of the machine really wrong or is it merely being fed the wrong data? In the same way the human mind, being called upon to resolve problems of a magnitude and with enough variables to confound any mere calculating machine a thousand times an hour, is prey to incorrect data. Incorrect data gets into the machine. The machine gives wrong answers. Incorrect data enters the human memory banks. The person reacts in an abnormal manner. Essentially, then, the problem of resolving aberration is the problem of finding a held down seven. But of that, much, much more, later. Right now we have accomplished our immediate ends. These are the various abilities and activities of the human mind in its constant task of free solving and putting into solution a multitude of problems. It perceives, it recalls or returns, it imagines, it conceives and then resolves, served by its extensions the perceptics and the memory banks and the imaginations, the mind brings forth answers which are invariably accurate, modified only by observation, education and viewpoint, and the basic purposes of that mind and the basic nature of man, as discoverable in the clear, are constructive and good, uniformly constructive and uniformly good, the solutions modified only by observation education and viewpoint. Man is good. Take away his basic aberrations and with them go the evil of which the scholastic and the moralist were so fond. The only detachable portion of him is the evil portion, and when it is detached, his personality and vigor intensify, and he is glad to see the evil portion go because it was physical pain. Later, there are experiments and proofs for these things and they can be measured with the precision so dear to the heart of the physical scientist. The clear, then, is not an adjusted person, driven to activity by his repressions now thoroughly insisted. He is an unrepressed person, operating on self-determinism, and his abilities to perceive recall, return, 
imagine, create and compute are outlined as we have seen. The clear is the goal in Dianetic Therapy, a goal which some patience and a little study and work can bring about. Any person can be cleared unless he has been so unfortunate as to have had a large portion of his brain removed or to have been born with a grossly malformed nervous structure. We have seen the goal of Dianetics here. Let us now inspect the goal of man. The goal of man. The goal of man. The lowest common denominator of all his activities. The dynamic principle of his existence, has long been sought. Should such an answer be discovered, it is inevitable that from it many answers would flow. It would explain all phenomena of behavior, it would lead toward a solution of man's major problems, and, most of all, it should be workable. Consider all knowledge to fall above or below a line of demarcation. Everything above this line is not necessary to the solution of man's aberrations and general shortcomings and is inexactly known. Such a field of thought could be considered to embrace such things as metaphysics and mysticism. Below this line of demarcation could be considered to lie the finite universe. All things in the finite universe, whether known or as yet unknown, can be sensed experienced or measured, the known data in the finite universe can be classified as scientific truth when it has been sensed, experienced and measured. All factors necessary to the resolution of a science of the mind were found within the finite universe and were discovered, sensed, measured and experienced, and became scientific truth. The finite universe contains time, space, energy and life. No other factors were found necessary in the equation. Time, space, energy and life have a single denominator in common. As an analogy, it could be considered that time, space, energy and life began at some point of origin and were commanded to continue to some nearly infinite destination. They were told nothing but what to do. They obey a single order and that order is survive. The dynamic principle of existence is survival. The goal of life can be considered to be infinite survival. Man, as a life form, can be demonstrated to obey in all his actions and purposes the one command, survive. It is not a new thought that man is surviving. It is a new thought that man is motivated only by survival. That his single goal is survival does not mean that he is the optimum survival mechanism which life has attained or will develop. The goal of the dinosaur was also survival and the dinosaur isn't extent anymore. Obedience to this command survive does not mean that every attempt to obey is uniformly successful. Changing environment, mutation, and many other things militate against any one organism attaining infallible survival techniques or form. Life forms change and die as new life forms develop just as surely as one life organism, lacking immortality in itself, creates other life organisms, then dies as itself. An excellent method, should one wish to cause life to survive over a very long period would be to establish means by which it could assume many forms. And death itself would be necessary in order to facilitate the survival of the life force itself, since only death and decay could clear away older forms when new changes in the environment necessitated new forms. Life, as a force existing over a nearly infinite period, would need a cyclic aspect in its unit organisms and forms. What would be the optimum survival characteristics of various life forms? They would have to have various fundamental characteristics, differing from one species to the next just as one environment differs from the next. This is important, since it has been but poorly considered in the past that a set of survival characteristics in one species would not be survival characteristics in another. The methods of survival can be summed under the headings of food, protection, defensive and offensive, and procreation. There are no existing life forms which lack solutions to these problems. Every life form errs, one way or another by holding a characteristic too long or developing characteristics which may lead to its extinction. But the developments which bring about successfulness of form are far more striking than their errors. The naturalist and biologist are continually resolving the characteristics of this or that life form by discovering that need rather than whim govern such developments. The hinges of the clamshell, the awesome face on the wings of the butterfly, 
have survival value. Once survival was isolated as the only dynamic of our life form which would explain all its activities, it was necessary to study further the action of survival, and it was discovered that when one considered pain and pleasure, he had at hand all the necessary ingredients with which to formulate the action life takes in its effort to survive. In order to establish nomenclature in Dianetics which would not be too complex for the purpose, words normally considered as adjectives or verbs have occasionally been pressed into service as nouns. This has been done on the valid principle that existing terminology, meaning so many different things, could not be used by Dianetics without making it necessary to explain away an old meaning to bring forth a new, to remove the step of explaining the old meaning and saying then that one doesn't mean that, thus entangling our communications inextricably, and to obviate the ancient custom of compounding ponderous and thundering syllables from the Greek and Roman tongues, this principle and some others have been adopted for nomenclature. Dynamic is here used as a noun and will so continue to be used throughout this volume. Somatic, perceptic and some others will be noted, defined when used. As will be seen in the accompanying graph, a spectrum of life has been conceived to span from the zero of death or extinction toward the infinity of potential immortality. This spectrum was considered to contain an infinity of lines, extending ladder-like toward the potential of immortality. Each line, as the ladder mounted, was spaced a little wider than the last, in a geometric progression. The thrust of survival is away from death and toward immortality. The ultimate pain could be conceived as existing just before death and the ultimate pleasure could be conceived as immortality. Immortality could be said to have an attractive type of force, and death a repelling force in the consideration of the unit organism or the species. But as survival rises higher and higher toward immortality, wider and wider spaces are encountered until the gaps are finitely impossible to bridge. The urge is away from death, which has a repelling force, and toward immortality, which has an attracting force. The attracting force is pleasure, the repelling force is pain. For the individual, the length of the arrow could be considered to be at a high potential within the fourth zone. Here the survival potential would be excellent and the individual would enjoy existence. From left to right could be graphed the years. The urge toward pleasure is dynamic. Pleasure is the reward, and the seeking of the reward, survival goals, would be a pleasurable act. And to ensure that survival is accomplished under the mandate survive. It seems to have been provided that reduction from a high potential would bring pain. Pain is provided to repel the individual from death, pleasure is provided to call him toward optimum life. The search for and the attainment of pleasure is not less valid in survival than the avoidance of pain. In fact, on some observed evidence, pleasure seems to have a much greater value in the cosmic scheme than pain. A fold-out version of this graph is contained at the back of this book. Now it would be well to define what is meant by pleasure aside from its connection with immortality. The dictionary states that pleasure is gratification, agreeable emotions, mental or physical, transient enjoyment opposed to pain. Pleasure can be found in so many things and activities that a catalogue of all the things and activities man has, does and may consider pleasurable alone could round out the definition. And what do we mean by pain? The dictionary states, physical or mental suffering, penalty. These two definitions, in passing, are demonstrative of an intuitive type of thought which runs through the language. Once one has a thing which leads to the resolution of hitherto unsolved problems, even the dictionaries are found to have always known it. If we wished to make this graph for a life form cycle, it would be identical except that the value of the years would be increased to measure reans, for there is no difference, it seems, except magnitude in the scope of the individual and the scope of the species. This inference could be drawn even without such remarkable evidence as the fact that a human being, growing from zygote to adult, evolutes through all the forms which the whole species is supposed to have evolved through. Now there is more in this graph than has been remarked as yet. The physical and mental state of the individual varies from hour to hour, day to day, year to year. Therefore, the level of survival would form either a daily curve or the curve of a life on a measure of hourly or yearly position in the zones. And there would be two curves made possible by this, 
the physical curve and the mental curve. When we get toward the back of the book, the relationships between these two curves will be found vital and it will also be seen that, ordinarily, a sag in the mental curve will precede a sag in the physical curve. The zones, then, can apply to two things, the physical being and the mental being. Therefore, these four zones can be called zones of the states of being. If a person is happy mentally, the survival level can be placed in zone 4. If the person is extremely ill physically, he might be plotted, on estimation of his illness, in zone 1 or close to death. Very unprecise but nevertheless descriptive names have been assigned to these zones. Zone 3 is one of general happiness and well-being. Zone 2 is a level of bearable existence. Zone 1 is one of anger. Zone 0 is the zone of apathy. These zones can be used as a tone scale by which a state of mind can be graded. Just above death, which is 0, would be the lowest mental apathy or lowest level of physical life. 0.1 A tone 1, where the body is fighting physical pain or illness or where the being is fighting in anger, could be graded from 1.0, which would be resentment or hostility, through tone 1.5, which would be a screaming rage, to a 1.9, which would be merely a quarrelsome inclination. From tone 2.0 to tone 3.0, there would be an increasing interest in existence and so forth. It so happens that the state of physical being or mental being does not long remain static. Therefore, there are various fluctuations. In the course of a single day an abri may run from 0.5 to 3.5, up and down, as a mental being. An accident or illness could cause a similar fluctuation in a day. These are, then, figures which can be assigned to four things the mental state on an acute basis and the mental state on a general, average basis, and the physical being on an acute basis and the physical being on a general basis. In Dianetics, we do not much employ the physical tone scale. The mental tone scale, however, is of vast and vital importance. These values of happiness, bearable existence, Anger and apathy are not arbitrary values. They are deduced from observation of the behavior of emotional states. A clear is usually found varying around tone 4, plus or minus in an average day. He is a general tone 4, which is one of the inherent conditions of being clear. A norm in current society, at a wild guess, is probably around a general tone 2.8. In this descriptic graph, which is two-dimensional, the vital data for the solution of the problem of the life dynamic are workably combined. The horizontal lines are in tenues of geometric progression beginning with the zero line immediately above death. There are ten lines for each zone and each zone denotes a mental or physical state of being, as noted. Geometric progression, so used, leaves ever-increasing spaces between the lines. The width of this space is the survival potential existing at the moment. The top point of the survival dynamic arrow is within that space. The further away from death the top point of the survival dynamic arrow is, the better chance the individual has of survival. Geometric progression reaches up toward the impossible of infinity and cannot, of course, reach infinity. The organism is surviving through time from left to right. Survival optimum, immortality, lies in terms of time to the right. Potential only is measured vertically. The survival dynamic actually resides within the organism as inherited from the species. The organism is part of the species as a railroad tie might be said to be part of a railroad as seen by an observer on a train. The observer being always in now. Although this analogy is not perhaps the best within itself, the organism possesses a repulsive force toward pain sources. The source of the pain is not a driving force any more than the thorn bush which tears the hand was a driving force, the organism repulses the potential pain of a thorn. At the same time, the organism has at work a force which attracts it to the sources of pleasure. Pleasure does not magnetize the organism into drawing near. It is the organism which possesses the attraction force. It is inherent. The repulsion of pain sources adds to the attraction for pleasure sources to operate as a combined thrust away from death and toward immortality. The thrust away from death is no more powerful than the thrust toward immortality. In other words, in terms of the survival dynamic, 
pleasure has as much validity as pain. It should not be read here that survival is always a matter of keeping an eye on the future. Contemplation of pleasure, pure enjoyment, contemplation of past pleasures, all combine into harmonies which, while they operate automatically as a rise toward the survival potential by their action within the organism physically, do not demand the future as an active portion of the mental computation in such contemplation. A pleasure which reacts to injure the body physically, as in the case of debauchery, discovers at work, a ratio between the physical effect, which is depressed toward pain, and the mental effect of experienced pleasure. There is a consequent lowering of the survival dynamic, averaging out, the future possibility of strain because of the act added to the state of being at the moment the debauchery was experienced, again depresses the survival dynamic. Because of this, various kinds of debauchery have been in indifferent odor with man throughout his history. This is the equation of immoral pleasures. And any action which has brought about survival suppression or which can bring it about, when pursued as a pleasure, has been denounced at some time or another in man's history. Immorality is originally hung as a label upon some act or class of actions because they depress the level of the survival dynamic. Future enforcement of moral stigma may depend largely upon prejudice and aberration and there is, consequently, a continuous quarrel over what is moral and what is immoral. Because certain things practiced as pleasures are actually pains and how easy it will be to trace out why when you've finished this volume and because of the moral equation as above, pleasure itself, in any aberrated society, can become decried. A certain kind of thinking, of which more, later, permits poor differentiation between one object and another. Confusing a dishonest politician with all politicians would be an example of this. In ancient times the Roman was fond of his pleasures and some of the things he called pleasure were a trifle strenuous on other species such as Christians. When the Christian overthrew the pagan state, the ancient order of Rome was in a villain's role. Anything, therefore, which was Roman was villainous. This went to such remarkable lengths that the Roman love of bailing made bailing so immoral that Europe went unwashed for some 1500 years. The Roman had become a pain source so general that everything Roman was evil and it stayed evil long after Roman paganism perished. Immorality, in such a fashion, tends to become an involved subject. In this case it became so involved that pleasure itself was stigmatized. When half the survival potential is struck from the list of lawful things, there is a considerable reduction in survival indeed. Considering this graph on a racial scale, the reduction of survival potential by one half would forecast that direful things lay in wait for the race. Actually, because man is after all man, no set of laws however enforced, can completely wipe away the attraction of pleasure, but in this case, enough was removed and banned to occasion precisely what happened, the dark ages and the recession of society. Society brightened only in those periods such as the renaissance in which pleasure became less unlawful. When a race or an individual drops into the second zone, as marked on the chart, and the general tone ranges from the first zone barely into the third, a condition of insanity ensues. Insanity is irrationality. It is also a state in which non-survival has been so closely approached continually that the race or the organism engages in all manner of will solutions. In further interpretation of this descriptic graph, there is the matter of the survival suppressor. This, it will be seen is a thrust downward out of potential immortality at the race or organism represented as the survival dynamic. The survival suppressor is the combined and variable threats to the survival of the race or organism. These threats come from other species, from time, from other energies. These are also engaged in the contest of survival to potential immortality in terms of their own species or identities. Thus there is a conflict involved. Every other form of life or energy could be plotted in a descriptic as the survival dynamic. If we were to use a duck's survival dynamic in a descriptic graph, we would see the duck seeking a high survival level and man would be a part of the duck's suppressor. The balance and nature of things do not permit the infinity of the goal of immortality to be reached. In fluctuating balance and in almost unlimited complexity, life and energies ebb and flood out of the nebulous, into fonds and, through decay, into the nebulous once more.
Many equations could be drawn concerning this, but it is outside the sphere of our present interest. In terms of the zones of the descriptic, it is of relative concern what the extent of the force of the suppressor is against the survival dynamic. The dynamic is inherent in individuals, groups and races, evolved to resist the suppressor through the eons. In the case of man, he carries with him another level of offensive and defensive techniques. His cultures, his primary technology of survival is mental activity governing physical action in the sentient echelon. But every life form has its own technology, formed to resolve the problems of food, protection and procreation. The degree of workability of the technology any life form develops, armor or brains, fleetness of foot or deceptive form, is a direct index of the survival potential, the relative immortality, of that form. There have been vast upsets in the past, man, when he developed into the world's most dangerous animal, he can and does kill or enslave any life form, doesn't he? overloaded the suppressor on many other life forms and they dwindled in number or vanished. A great climatic change, such as the one which packed so many mammoths in Siberian ice, may overload the suppressor on a life form. A long drought in the American Southwest in not too ancient times wiped out the better part of an Indian civilization. The Veda, also Lucretius nature of things. A cataclysm such as an explosion off the core of the earth, if that were possible or the atom bomb or the sudden cessation of burning on the sun would wipe out all life forms on earth, and a life form can even overload the suppressor on itself, a dinosaur destroys all his food and so destroys the dinosaur, a bubonic plague bacillus attacks its hosts with such thorough appetite that the whole generation of pasteula pestis vanishes, such things are not intended by the suicide to be suicide. The life form has run up against an equation which has an unknown variable, and the unknown variable unfortunately contained enough value to overload the suppressor. This is the didn't know the gun was loaded equation. And if the bubonic plague bacillus overloads its own suppressor in an area and then ceases to trouble its food and shelter, the animals, then the animals consider themselves benefited. Reckless and clever and well nigh indestructible man has led a course which is a far cry from tooth and claw in every sphere. And so have the redwood tree and the shark. Just as a life form, man, like every life form, is symbiotic. Life is a group effort. Lichens and plankton and algae may do very well on sunlight and minerals alone, but they are the building blocks. Above such existence, as the forms grow more complex. A tremendous interdependence exists. It is very well for a forester to believe that certain trees willfully kill all other varieties of trees around them and then conclude a specious attitude of trees. Let him look again. What made the soil? What provides the means of keeping the oxygen balance? What makes it possible for rain to fall in other areas? These willful and murderous trees, and squirrels plant trees, and man plants trees, and trees shelter trees of another kind, and animals fertilize trees, and trees shelter animals, and trees hold the soil so less well-rooted plants can grow. Look anywhere and everywhere and we see life as an assist for life. The multitude of the complexities of life as affinities for life is not dramatic, but they are the steady, practical, important reason life can continue to exist at all. A redwood tree may be first out for redwood trees and although it does an excellent job of seeming to exist as redwood alone, a closer glance will show it has dependencies and is depended upon. Therefore, the dynamic of any life form can be seen to be assisted by many other dynamics and combines with them against the suppressive factors. Non-survive alone. Necessity has been declared to be a very wonderful thing. But necessity is a word which has been taken rather loosely for granted. Opportunism seems to have been read largely into necessity. What is necessity? Besides being the mother of invention, is it a dramatic, sudden thing which excuses wars and murders? which touches a man only when he is about to starve, or is necessity a much gentler and less dramatic quantity? Everything, according to Leucippus, is driven by necessity. This is a keynote of much theorizing down through the ages. Driven, that is the key to the error, driven, things are driven. Necessity drives, pain drives, necessity and pain, pain and necessity. Recalling the dramatic and overlooking the important. 
man has conceived himself, from time to time, to be an object of chase by necessity and pain. These were two anthropomorphic, man-like, things which, in full costume, stuck spears at him. It can be said to be a wrong concept merely because it does not work to produce more answers. Whatever there is of necessity is within him. Nothing is driving him except his original impetus to survive. And he carries that within himself or his group. Within him is the force with which he fends off pun. Within him is the force with which he attracts pleasure. It chances to be a scientific fact that man is a self-determined organism to the outermost limit that any form of life can be, for he still depends upon other forms of life and his general environment, but he is self-determined. This is a matter which will be covered later. But right here it is necessary to indicate that he is not inherently a determined organism in the sense that he is driven on this wonderful stimulus response basis which looks so neat in certain textbooks and works so completely unworkably in the world of man. The happy little illustrations about rats do not serve when we are talking about man. The more complex the organism, the less reliably the stimulus response equation works. And when one reaches that highest complexity, man, he has reached a fine degree of variability in terms of stimulus response. The more sentient, the more rational an organism, the more that organism is self determined. Self determinism, like all things, is relative. Compared to a rat, however, man is very self-determined indeed. This is only a scientific fact because it can easily be proven. The more sentient the man, the less he is a push-button instrument. Aberrated and reduced, he can, of course, in a limited degree, be made to perform like a marionette, but then it is understood that the more aberrated a person is, the closer he approaches the intelligence quotient of an animal. Given this self-determinism, it is interesting to observe what a man does with it. While he can never escape the didn't know it was loaded equation in terms of cataclysm or the unexpected gain of some other life form, he operates in a high zone level of survival potential. But here he is, self-determined, rational, his primary weapon, his mind in excellent working order. What are his necessity instincts? Necessity, according to that very sentient if rapidly subject changing article, the dictionary, is the state of being necessary, that which is unavoidable, compulsion. It also adds that necessity is extreme poverty, but we don't want that. We are talking about survival. The compulsion mentioned can be re-evaluated in terms of the survival dynamic. That is interior in the organism and the race. And what is necessary to survival? We have seen and can prove clinically that there are two factors at work. The necessity of avoiding pain is a factor because, degree by degree, little things, not much in themselves, can amount to large pains which, compounded in that rapid geometric progression, bring on death. Pain is the sadness of being bawled out for pork, because that may lead to being fired, which may lead to starvation, which may lead to death. Run any equation into which pain has entered and it can be seen that it reduces down to possible non-survival. And if this were all there were to surviving and if necessity were a vicious little gnome with a pitchfork, it seems rather obvious that there would be scant reason to go on living. But there is the other part of the equation, pleasure. That is a more stable part than pain, stoics to the contrary, as clinical tests in Dianetics prove. There is therefore a necessity for pleasure, for working, as happiness can be defined, toward known goals over not unknowable obstacles. And the necessity for pleasure is such that a great deal of pain can be borne to attain it. Pleasure is the positive commodity. It is enjoyment of work, contemplation of deeds well done, it is a good book or a good friend, it is taking all the skin off one's knees climbing the Matterhorn, it is hearing the kid first say daddy. It is a brawl on the bond at Shanghai or the whistle of Moor from a doorway, it's adventure and hope and enthusiasm and someday I'll learn to paint, it's eating a good meal or kissing a pretty girl or playing a stiff game of bluff on a stock exchange. It's what man does that he enjoys doing, it's what man does that he enjoys contemplating, it's what man does that he enjoys remembering and it may be just the talk of things he knows he'll never do. Men will endure a lot of pain to obtain a little pleasure. Out in the laboratory of the world, it takes very little time to confirm that. And how does necessity fit this picture? There is a necessity for pleasure, 
a necessity is live and quivering and vital as the human heart itself. He who said that a man who had two loaves of bread should sell one to buy white hyacinth, spoke sooth. The creative, the constructive, the beautiful, the harmonious, the adventurous, yes, and even escape from the more of oblivion, these things are pleasure and these things are necessity. There was a man once who had walked a thousand miles just to see an orange tree and another who was a mass of scars and poor set bones who was eager just to get a chance to fan another bronc. It is very well to dwell in some Olympian height and write a book of penalties and very well to read to find what writers said that other writers said but it is not very practical. The pain drive theory does not work. If some of these basics of Dianetics were only poetry about the idyllic state of man, they might be justified in that, but it happens that out in the laboratory of the world, they work. Man, in affinity with man, survives, and that survival is pleasure. The four dynamics. In the original equations of Dianetics, when the research was young, it was believed that survival could be envisioned in personal terms alone and still answer all conditions. A theory is only as good as it works, and it works as well as it explains observed data and predicts new material which will be found, in fact, to exist. Survival in personal terms was computed until the whole activity of man could be theoretically explained in terms of self alone. The logic looked fairly valid, but then it was applied to the world something was wrong, it did not solve problems. In fact, the theory of survival in personal terms alone was so unworkable that it left a majority of behavior phenomena unexplained. But it could be computed and it still looked good. Then it was that a nearly intuitive idea occurred. Man's understanding developed in ratio to his recognition of his brotherhood with the universe. That was high flown, but it yielded results. Was man himself a brotherhood of man? He had evolved and become strong as a gregarious being, an animal that hunted in packs. It seemed possible that all his activities could be computed in terms of the survival of the group. That computation was made. It looked good. Men survived, it was postulated, solely in terms of the survival of his group. It looked good, but it left a majority of observed phenomena unexplained. It was attempted then, to explain man's behavior in terms of mankind alone, which is to say, it was assumed that mankind survived for mankind in a highly altruistic way. This was straight down the sylvan path of Jean Jacques Rousseau. It could be computed that man lived alone for the survival of all mankind. But when addressed to the laboratory, the world, it did not work. Finally, it was recalled that some had thought that man's entire activity and all his behavior could be explained by assuming that he lived for sex alone. This was not an original assumption. But some original computations were made upon it and it is true that, by a few quick twists of the equation, his survival activity can be made to resolve on only the sexual basis. But when this was applied to observed data, Again it failed to explain every phenomenon. An examination was made of what had been attempted. It had been assumed that man survived only for himself as an individual, it had been computed that he survived only for the group, the pack, for society, it had been postulated that he survived only for mankind, and finally, it had been theorized that he lived only for sex. None worked alone. A new computation was made on the survival dynamic. Exactly for what was man surviving? All four of these factors, self, sex, group and mankind, were entered into a new equation. And now it was found, a theory was in hand which worked. It explained all observed phenomena and it predicted new phenomena which were discovered to exist. It was a scientific equation. Therefore, from the survival dynamic, in this fashion, were evolved the four dynamics. By survival dynamic was meant the basic command survive, which underlay all activity. By dynamic was meant one of the four purpose divisions of the entire dynamic principle. The four dynamics were not new forces, they were subdivisions of the primary force. Dynamic one is the urge toward ultimate survival on the part of the individual and for himself. It includes his immediate symbiotes, the extension of culture for his own benefit and name immortality. Dynamic two is the urge of the individual toward ultimate survival via the sex act, the creation of and the rearing of children. It includes their symbiotes, the extension of culture for them and their future provision. 
Dynamic 3 is the urge of the individual toward ultimate survival for the group. It includes the symbiotes of the group and the extension of its culture. Dynamic 4 includes the urge of the individual toward ultimate survival for all mankind. It includes the symbiotes of mankind and the extension of its culture. Life, the atom and the universe and energy itself are included under the symbiotic classification. It will be seen immediately that these four dynamics are actually a spectrum without sharp division lines. The survival dynamic can be seen to sweep out from the individual to embrace the entire species and its symbiotes. None of these dynamics is necessarily stronger than any of the others. Each is strong. They are the four roads a man takes to survival, and the four roads are actually one road, and the one road is actually a spectrum of thousands of roads contained within the four. They are all in terms of past, present and future in that the present may be a sum of the past and the future may be the product of the past and present. The Dianetic meaning of symbiote is extended beyond the dictionary definition to mean any or all life or energy forms which are mutually dependent for survival. The atom depends on the universe the universe on the atom. All the purposes of man can be considered to lie within this spectrum and all behavior becomes explained. That man is selfish is a valid statement when one means an aberrated man. That man is antisocial is an equally valid statement if one adds the modifier, aberration, and other such statements resolve equally. Now it happens that these four dynamics can be seen to compete, one with another in their operation within an individual or a society. There is a rational reason for this. The phrase social competition is a compound of aberrated behavior and sentient difficulties. Any man, group or race may be in contest with any race, group or man and even in contest with sex on an entirely rational level. The equation of the optimum solution would be that a problem has been well resolved which portends the maximum good for the maximum number of dynamics. That is to say that any solution, modified by the time available to put the solution into effect, should be creative or constructive for the greatest possible number of dynamics. The optimum solution for any problem would be a solution which achieved the maximum benefit in all the dynamics. This means that a man, determining upon some project, would fare best if he benefited everything concerned in the four dynamics as his project touched them. He would then have to benefit himself, as well, for the solution to be optimum. In other words, the benefiting of the group and mankind dynamics, but the blocking of the sex dynamic and the self dynamic would be much poorer than the best solution. The conduct survival pattern is built upon this equation of the optimum solution. It is the basic equation of all rational behavior and is the equation on which a clear functions. It is inherent in man. In other words, the best solution to any problem is that which will bring the greatest good to the greatest number of beings, including self progeny, family associates, political and racial groups, and at length to all mankind. The greatest good may require, as well, some destruction, but the solution deteriorates in a ratio to the destructiveness employed. Self-sacrifice and selfishness are alike reductive of the optimum action equation and alike have been suspected and should be. This is entirely a matter of, does it work, even on an unaberrated basis? There are times when one or another of these dynamics has to be dropped from the computation of some activity or other and, indeed, few problems are so entirely intense that they must take into account all the dynamics. But when a problem achieves such intensity, and time is not an important factor, serious errors can follow the omission of one or another of the dynamics from the factors considered. In the case of a Napoleon saving France at the expense of the remainder of mankind in Europe, the equation of the optimum solution was so far neglected that all the revolutionary gains of the French people were lost. In the case of Caesar saving Rome, the equation was so poorly done that the survival of Rome was impeded. But there are special cases when the equation of the optimum solution becomes so involved with time that certain dynamics must be neglected to permit other dynamics to persist. The case of a sailor giving his own life to save his ship answers the group dynamic. Such an action is a valid solution to a problem but it violates the optimum solution because it did not answer for dynamic one, self. Many examples of various kinds could be cited where one or another of the dynamics must, of necessity, receive priority, 
all on an entirely rational basis. On an aberrated basis the equation is still valid, but complicated by irrationalities which have no part of the situation. Many solutions are bad merely because of false educational data or no data at all, but these are still solutions. In the case of aberrated solutions, the dynamics are actually and actively impeded, as will later to be outlined in full. Summary the dynamic principle of existence is survival. This survival can be graduated into four zones, each one progressively portending a better opportunity of reaching the potential of immortality. Zone 0 borders from death and includes apathy, Zone 1 borders from apathy and includes violent effort, Zone 2 borders from violence into mediocre but not entirely satisfactory success. Zone 3 borders from the mediocre to the excellent chance. These zones are each occasioned by the ratio of the suppressor to the survival dynamic. In apathy, zone 0, the suppressor appears too great to be overcome. In the area of violence, zone 1, the suppressor more or less overbalances the survival dynamic, requiring enormous effort which, when expended without result, drops the organism into the zero zone. In the area of mediocrity, zone 2, the suppressor and the survival dynamic are more or less evenly balanced. In the area of zone 3, the survival dynamic has overcome the suppressor and, the chances of survival being excellent, is the area of high response to problems. These four zones might be classed as the zone of no hope, the zone of violent action, the area of balance and the area of high hope. Clinical experiment is the basis of these zones, since they follow a progress of mental or physical being as it rises from the death area into high existence. The four dynamics are subdivisions of the survival dynamic and are, in mankind, the thrust toward potential survival in terms of entities. They embrace all the purposes, activities and behavior of mankind. They could be said to be a conduct survival pattern. The first of these, but not necessarily the most important nor yet the one which will receive priority in various efforts, is the individual dynamic, dynamic one, which includes the personal survival of the individual as a living person and the survival of his personal symbiotes, dynamic two is the thrust toward potential immortality through children and includes all sexual activity as well as the symbiotes of the children, dynamic three is survival in terms of the group which term may include such things as a club, a military company, a city, a state, a nation, this would include the symbiotes of the group, dynamic 4 is the thrust toward potential immortality of mankind as a species and the symbiotes of mankind, embraced within these classifications are any part of existence, any form of matter and, indeed, the universe, any problem or situation discoverable within the activities or purposes of mankind is embraced within these dynamics. The equation of the optimum solution is inherent within the organism and, modified by education or viewpoint and modified further by time, is the operating method of unoperated individuals, groups or mankind. The equation of the optimum solution is always present even in severely aberrated individuals and is used as modified by their education, viewpoint and available time. The aberration does not remove activity from the dynamics of survival. Aberrated conduct is irrational survival conduct and is fully intended to lead to survival. That the intent is not the act does not eradicate the intent. These are the fundamental axioms of Dianetics. The dynamic principle of existence survive survival considered as the single and sole purpose subdivides into four dynamics by symbiotism and all entities and energies which aid survival dynamic one is the urge of the individual toward survival for the individual and his symbiotes dynamic two is the urge of the individual toward survival through procreation it includes both the sex act and the raising of progeny the care of children and their symbiotes Dynamic 3 is the urge of the individual toward survival for the group, or the group for the group, and includes the symbiotes of that group. Dynamic 4 is the urge of the individual toward survival for mankind or the urge toward survival of mankind for mankind as well as the group for mankind, etc., and includes the symbiotes of mankind. The absolute goal of survival is immortality or infinite survival. This is sought by the individual in terms of himself as an organism, 
as a spirit or as a name, or as his children, as a group of which he is a member or as mankind and the progeny and symbiotes of others as well as his own. The reward of survival activity is pleasure. The ultimate penalty of destructive activity is death or complete non-survival, and is pain. Successes raise the survival potential toward infinite survival. Failures lower the survival potential toward death. The human mind is engaged upon perceiving and retaining data, composing or computing conclusions and posing and resolving problems related to organisms along all four dynamics and the purpose of perception, retention, concluding and resolving problems is to direct its own organism and symbiotes and other organisms and symbiotes along the four dynamics toward survival. Intelligence is the ability to perceive, pose and resolve problems. The dynamic is the tenacity to life and vigor and persistence in survival. Both the dynamic and intelligence are necessary to persist and accomplish and neither is a constant quantity from individual to individual, group to group. The dynamics are inhibited by engrams, which lie across them and disperse life force. Intelligence is inhibited by engrams, which feed false or improperly graded data into the analyzer. Happiness is the overcoming of not unknown obstacles toward an own goal and, transiently, the contemplation of or indulgence in pleasure. The analytical mind is that portion of the mind which perceives and retains experience data to compose and resolve problems and direct the organism along the four dynamics. It thinks in differences and similarities. The reactive mind is that portion of the mind which flies and retains physical pain and painful emotion and seeks to direct the organism solely on a stimulus response basis. It thinks only in identities. The somatic mind mind is that mind which, directed by the analytical or reactive mind, places solutions into effect on the physical level. A training pattern is that stimulus response mechanism resolved by the analytical mind to care for routine activity or emergency activity. It is held in the somatic mind and can be changed at will by the analytical mind. Habit is that stimulus response reaction dictated by the reactive mind from the content of engrams and put into effect by the somatic mind. It can be changed only by those things which change engrams. Aberrations under which is included all deranged or irrational behavior, are caused by engrams. They are stimulus response pro and contra survival. Psychosomatic ills are caused by engrams. The engram is the single source of aberrations and psychosomatic ills. Moments of unconsciousness when the analytical mind is attenuated in greater or lesser degree are the only moments when engrams can be received. The eng semicolon ralt is a moment of unconsciousness containing physical pain or painful emotion and all perceptions and is not available to the analytical mind as experience. Emotion is three things. Engramic response to situations, endocrine metering of the body to meet situations on an analytical level and the inhibition or the furtherance of life force. The potential value of an individual or a group may be expressed by the equation P, V equals I, D, power X, where I is intelligence and D is dynamic. The worth of an individual is computed in terms of the alignment, on any dynamic of his potential value with optimum survival along that dynamic. A high PV may, by reversed vector, result in a negative worth as in some severely aberrated persons. A high PV on any dynamic assures a high worth only in the unaberrated person.